JP read that, and then on the he made, I think the locust was playing with Spanish Corsa, and he printed that particular part of the article on the back of the flyer. So yeah, Chris and Araby's welcome to San Diego was like JP being like, fuck you guys. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000 punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle, and happy 2023 to all of you. Before we start, go follow my Instagram at This Was The Scene so you can stay up to date on everything that's cool. Jejun was an American rock band formed in 96 at Berklee College of Music in Boston, Massachusetts. The band has been commonly identified with the emo genre and was heavily involved with the scene at the peak of the second wave of emo in the mid-90s. The three founding members, Arabella, Joe, and Chris, all met while studying at the college. The band relocated to San Diego, California in 97, and they have three releases, which are Junk, which was released in 97, This Afternoon's Malady, which was released in 98, and R.A.P. in 2000. And I also believe a lot of you have or had that split with Jimmy Eat World, uh, which we discuss. I still have it. And uh, it's still great. I should probably give it a spin this week just to commemorate this uh, interview finally happening. So I basically tried for a while to get Joe on the Skype, and I finally did. And this is what we chat about. Being roommates with the president of Geffen Records, dropping out of Berkeley, Rama from Big Wheel, staying in touch with Jim from Jimmy Eat World, will they ever have a reunion show, the split with Jimmy Eat World, his band I Wish I, the actuality of Thought Video Comp, changing their sound on the second record, almost being kidnapped by Germans, and a ton more. Finally, if you're looking for a logo animation for a video bumper for your business or your personal brand, YouTube channel, whatever, you can hire me to do so. Just go to drive80.com and you just click on the logos tab and that'll show you different samples and pricing. It's a great way to make your shit look a little bit more professional and um, it just makes it also look fucking cool. So you should go do that. So all I got to say, so feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some punk rock nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. So I read that you guys had started the band in Berkeley, but I, for some reason, I thought you grew up in Massachusetts, so I didn't realize you grew up in San Diego. So, I mean, yeah, that's, that's kind of what, di- what went down is um, uh, I grew up here in San Diego and then, yeah, went to Berkeley, met Chris and Araby. Araby was about to finish. She only had like, so yeah, I went through a year. I went through a year there. I met Chris because I was wearing an unbroken shirt. He's like, oh, cool. I'm in this band called Tearwater. We play like with a lot of straight edge hardcore bands and shit too. And then he already knew Araby probably because he thought she was cute or something and became friends with her. Yeah, I just threw around the idea of starting a band after hanging out with Chris mostly. And so Chris had been there for two years. That was, it was his second year. It was only my first year. And then he interjects something really kind of crazy right away because it's it's the craziest thing so when you when you go to berkeley they make you live on the campus in the in the building and it's filled with fucking mice especially you know in the winter it's cool it it was the blizzard of 96 when i was there you know a lot of the roads were shut down and shit um and and you didn't want to go anywhere but like where else would you want to be than in a big building full of musicians with like practice rooms like you know on every level of the dormitory it it was fun but my roommate when i was there for the whole first year who like probably was you know best one of my best friends the whole time uh besides chris and the friends i was making the scene or whatever was my roommate and his name is neil jacobson and he went on to become the president of geffen records your roommate became the president of geffen records yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jesus yeah. Christ. He mar- married Iovine's daughter and everything. Married Iovine's daughter, took over the company, like, and then the record label fell. So I think it was kind of like for Iovine. I think it was kind of like a thing where he didn't he didn't want it to fall under him. So he passed it along to Neil, who had married his daughter. I mean, Neil was in the business already. His story is almost a little bit similar in that he dropped out like I did and then made connections really because he was a caddy at like an upstate 
fancy New York golf club. I can't remember the name. Some some Hollywood A and R bigwig guy like took him under his wing and then gave him a job. And it's eventually he became the fucking president of Geffen Records. And he won't call any of us old friends back. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Like I said, also yeah. And then yeah, the the label fell once he took control and then he started this thing called like the music acquisition company, which I guess is kind of like what all the big labels are doing now. They're not really focusing on the old days, obviously, because music is fucking free now. Yeah. Trying to acquire kind of licensing for like everything that might make them a penny or two. When you guys were rooming together, was he talking about like, what was his, cause I mean, you got to go to Berkeley. You got to be, proficient at a certain instrument yeah he was he was a badass drummer he was a badass drummer for sure but he, he went on to like a and r for like like y class all these like real like big stars but like in the pop world and the funny thing is is yeah and, and in hip-hop especially he was a and ring and managing these guys that were in, in hip-hop and the funny thing is is like i would play hip-hop in our dorm room and he wasn't into it at all. His favorite shit was like the Grateful Dead, fucking um, Medeski Martin and Wood, and Traffic. And he, he was like one of those dudes where like he didn't seem to have a whole lot of common sense and he was a troublemaker. But he got in more trouble than I did fucking with the res, the dorm res guy, like stealing his shit even. And like they, they'd come to our room like Neil's causing problems again and like fucking like he, if you got a cold you would just talk to Lily like on the wall of like the school like disrespectful like you know and and, he, and this is the funny part is I think Berkeley gave him like one of those posts oh you didn't graduate but now you're like we're giving you the uh, ceremonial degree or whatever they do that for a whole bunch of fucking people it's really funny yeah you're like an honored alumni now you know what I mean like when he used to just tear shit up there. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're saying that, you're like, so when, when you went there and you're like, he got more in trouble than you, I'm kind of guessing when you went there, were you excited to go to the school or like, what was your whole perspective of that? Oh, of course. Of course. I mean, yeah, at one point I really thought I would be like the next Danny Elfman or some shit. It's, like, it's, it's exciting. Dude. It's an exciting time of life. You're, I had just got done with 13 years of Catholic school. So I'm getting away from my parents and here and yeah, they're immersed in music and like jazz became a focus because, uh, you know, I chose it as my first focus there, jazz piano. Well, that's the funny thing about Berkeley. It's like, not, I got accepted to, to uh, Juilliard and I went there. I mean, I went to the, to the fucking thing and everything, the uh, audition and everything. And I didn't even know until I went to the audition. Now that it's like, so what do you want to do? Well, I want to play learn jazz piano. Like, well, like, what are you doing here? This is a classical conservatory. Like we don't, if you want to play jazz, like go hang out on the street or at the clubs and stuff. Like we don't teach that shit here. I know it's changed. It's changed now. Like they're more liberal now, but they, like, Juilliard used to be like a fun conservative school they didn't teach anything about like classical i think you, you could there was extracurricular shit you could do but like the main curriculum was like classical stuff anyway that's the funny thing about berkeley is like yeah the first semester i took classical jazz piano from this eastern european jazz wizard guy and then the second semester i took heavy metal guitar lessons from joe stump and it's like, you don't know who Joe Stump is. Joe Stump. He's as good as Steve Vai or even Marty Friedman or any of those Shredder guys, if you ask me. He just doesn't get the glory that like some of those guys do because I think he's just kind of happy to be like a teacher at Berkeley. Like, And the dude actually looks like it's like you drop like an anvil on Steve Vai, like... Like, he's got, like, all the rings and the long curly hair and the blousey shirt, the turquoise and pink cowboy boots and shit. Kind of like a squashed version of him, you know what I mean? But, like, dude, yeah, he's just ultimate shredder guy. I, I love that shit. The other students would make fun of me. Like, my punk rock friends would make fun of me because virtuosity isn't really an admiral thing, you know, in punk rock. 
but I was into good power shredding guys and he was, he was awesome, dude. He was an amazing teacher. We would play two part Bach inventions and, in, and, in, you know, in our lessons and it was awesome. It was awesome. Did you go to school, like when you were there, did you want to be in a band or did you just want to be like a studio musician? I didn't know what the fuck I wanted, dude. You know, like I said, I, I just got done 13 years of Catholic school, eight years at a Catholic grammar school that was down the street here in Normal Heights and four years at an all boys Catholic high school in North Park. My parents were super fucking strict, which is why I probably got in trouble all the time. So <laughs> probably. This is what happened, basically. Yeah, I mean, I, of course, I, I planned to stick it out. I, I wanted to graduate, get a degree, and, and be a fucking a film score guy. Mm. But uh, there was one class uh, called orchestration where class was fucking hard, man. You had to, write, you had to learn how to write, write music for every instrument in the orchestra. I thought I did a a fine job i was also partying very hard you know you got a taste of liberation and i was definitely partying and making friends with uh, people that were coming to be the band and all that shit so the final for that class was like you presented your writings of whatever song it was to the class and they played it and the drummer guy like I had, I had a kind of beef with him because I just didn't like him. When it, the drum, the, in the class, uh, the guy that they selected to perform my song, and he's like, I can't read this. I can't do it. And like I'd already missed enough classes because I was focusing on Jeju. So I failed the fucking class. And yeah, my dad's like, am I going to spend $30,000 to send you back to this school if you're going to fuck around? And I was just like, no, nah, no. Nah. You know what? Nah. But yeah, because like I started the band, we started the band. Rama was behind us. We were doing little tours, and uh, yeah, exactly. What's the question? Are you going to stay at school, or are you going to, you know, go play in a rock band? I'm going to go play a rock. Band. So, how did you guys form? How'd the band form? Yeah. So Chris had met Araby, I think, from some maybe a mutual class or two. I think it was yeah, more than just seeing her around. Yeah, he was just friends with her, and I met Chris, and he's, it, Chris and I maybe jammed once or twice because we realized we liked a lot of the same stuff. It was kind of his idea to try jamming with this girl because she wants to play bass, even though she doesn't have one and no, has never played one. Oh, so she was in a Berkeley? She was, yeah, she was a student. She was about to finish, so that's what I'm saying. Like, I dropped out after a year Chris dropped out after two years. I met him when I was there during his second year. We started the band. We realized we wanted to keep the band going. Chris and I realized we were going to drop out, but Araby was almost finished. So Chris moved out here, San Diego, while Araby finished, and then she eventually moved out here too. So the band relocated back to San Diego, my hometown. Wait, so what was her instrument that she was going to school for? vocals and prime and, and, and it's like she's got a degree in engineering how are you okay with her just picking up the bass and playing like on a whim because she sounded good yeah she, she like she she'd been in band and around guitars and shit long enough i think to at least know how they operate and probably probably had a guitar or you know acoustic guitar in her room or something at a very young age so it's not like she had never touched like an instrument before i just don't think she'd ever decided to actually play bass before you know was she also in the, so it sounds like you and chris were in the same music scene was she also a part of that or did you guys introduce that introduce the scene to her so, so she she's from hawaii you know obviously very different as far as being able to see live bands and stuff she was in a, like an extremely successful reggae band before she took off for college, I think like one of the most uh, successful bands, reggae bands from Hawaii. Uh, what were they called? Uh, I'm going to blank on their name. Um, she gave me the CD at one point and it was really good. It was just like sound like Burning Spear or some shit. So no, she, she was down. She knew a lot of good punk rock and stuff. Her favorite stuff was like Clutch and Jawbreaker. So she didn't know so much about say like, 
the spit that I was obsessed with, like the discord scene or say like the gravity scene here in San Diego, specific stuff like that. But as far as like she read her themes and had a pretty eclectic taste in underground punk rock music. So were you guys playing in Massachusetts or did you guys form the band in San Diego? No, yeah, we, we were playing at the Middle East. We played a bunch of places. Yeah, Rama found us and started booking it for us, I think, like, right after our first show. And we started the band, like, yeah, maybe three or four months into the school year. So we were doing it for, like, six months. We just, yeah, I don't know why, but we, we just seemed to get real positive reaction right away from the clubs we played at and bands that we played with and uh just made connections real fast seems like everything happened real fast in those days well i mean you guys were only a band for what like three years two years four years five almost yeah four four and a half something because it was during 96 and until like almost 2001 something like that yeah. Yeah, because on Discogs it says R.I.P. is the last thing you're on, which is like a compilation. Right. Right. Yeah, and we still played some shows even after that came out. So let's like go back to you guys form the band, and then when you're in San Diego, because I know Rama he lived out in L.A. Yeah, he moved to L.A., but that wasn't even until like 2002 or something, like when Big Wheel was like dissolving. Because he started another record label the the moment he moved out there called Tarantula's Attack. And I think the only band that crossed over from Big Wheel or maybe even anything was um, The Explosion. Like, he focused on them. Yeah, he was, like, their their uh, manager, I believe. Right. So, like, actually, and real quick, I know you said it before, but it's Jejun. Like, it's not Jejun, it's Jejun. Yeah, I mean, I don't care. But yeah, technically, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of because like, I know people are going to have a question. Like, I interviewed this band called Blunt, and I was like, is it Blount or Blunt? He's like, it's Blunt. I was like, all right. And so people were like, oh my God, I've been wanting to know that forever. So, because everyone has, I've, I've interviewed people and they've said your name multiple ways. I was like, okay, what's like the proper way moving forward to say this? Yeah, you, you got it. You got it. But maybe we should ask that new band calling themselves Jejun that is actually touring with Jimmy World and shit. Like, that's. I don't know if you know about that. That's I just, just funny to me. Yeah, I just saw that. Wait, they're they're touring with Jimmy Eat World? And they did some shows with Jimmy Eat World, yeah. That's fucking weird, man. It is. And, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, asked, I asked Jim about it, and he's like, hey, you guys are playing with another band called Jay Chu? And then he just laughed. Yeah, uh, they're the Norwegian Jay Chu. And you know, I just like, I think I wrote back like, oh, Cool. Nobody cares, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, it's uh yeah it's uh a young post punk quintet out of Christiansen, Norway. I've listened to their skit. It doesn't sound like post punk to me. It sounds like fucking just like regular ass modern indie pop, sh- whatever. <laughs> I don't hear any punk. I don't hear any punk in it at all, dude. Yeah. Do you still wait? You still have um, you're still connected with Jim from Jimmy Eat World? I mean. We're still, we know each other, we're friends, and yeah, we'll, we'll drop comments and jokes and shit here and there, yeah. Oh, that's, that's fucking cool. We don't hang out, you know, but yeah, I mean, I, if they come to town, I try to go. I just haven't been able to go the last couple of times, but yeah, when they came to Coors Amphitheater, and I had just had my kid a while back, and I went to go see him, and yeah, I catch up with them when I can, man. They're, they're fucking awesome. They're the nicest guys that ever got to be rock stars i mean if it should have happened for anybody it, it it should have happened for them because number one they toured their ass off and they wanted it bad number two they genuinely genuinely are the nicest fucking guys in the world um how can i say Give an example like we broke down in shitty butthole utah when we headed out one time and rick we broke down and Rick drove their van to come pick us up and take us like where we needed to go just because he didn't have anything else to do. Yeah, they're, they're, they're just cool, man. It's nice. And, and their shows were 
were, were fire back then. And anybody that saw them would tell you that they were. Yeah, they were just like they were just that band. Like we all put them on a pedestal. Like this is this is like the fucking band. Before knowing anything that they were associated with Christy Front Drive or anything, like yeah, just hearing Static Prevails, and that's I mean the first song on Static Prevails is still my favorite Jimmy World song. When they got back together and did the, um, and I'll jump back more in the history of you guys, but like when they did the Clarity Tour, I know that they brought No Knife and I think maybe another band that they had come up with back in the day. Was there any talks with you guys to maybe play a couple shows on that? It, it wouldn't have mattered because Araby will never do it. Araby will just never consider doing Jejun again. Why? Trust me, dude. I've tr- I've tried to work every fucking angle <laughs> I can with her. She's not interested. There's a, there's a lot of different reasons, dude. She'll tell you it's because she's a mom now, and like going out on the road with dudes just not at all on her priority list. Number two, I don't think she's that proud of the music that we made. I think for her, the whole time it was kind of almost more just like an experiment you know it started as an experiment for her almost as she needed something to record like for projects for school for berkeley yeah another thing is i don't think that she felt like she ever had the creative control that she wanted i was pretty tyrannical back then and like my vision what i thought i wanted it to be and that and my vision would change so that was probably very frustrating for her you know at one point we we're playing what I think is this kind of rock, punk inspired rock. But yeah, a couple of the songs we did, like the Indian Giver or, um, you know, one or two other songs on the first record, Junk, kind of put us into that emo category. It had that emo sound or whatever, but we, we didn't, we never really, I never really bought into the whole thing. I loved Christy Fred Drive and I loved even sunny day real estate but i wasn't trying to sound like that so much you know some bands that we get lumped into they really embrace that this this emo sound idea say like rainer and maria even even though i love their music but if you ask somebody what does emo sound like especially like mid 90s emo that that's going to make more sense to them you know than what we were doing or whatever I think everybody liked... I thought you guys clearly fell into the whole emo genre, though. Hmm. Even with the second record? I'm a, yeah, Junk was the one that I... That was, that was the only one I got. And and also, there's the split with Jimmy Eat World, which I want to talk about. And then there's that song on the Actuality of Thought video compilation that you guys are on. Like, like the sound, just to me, was just... I mean, if it was slow, it was just considered... If it was, if it was underground and slow, I think people were just like, oh, they're an emo band. And you're like, well, not really... Right, and sad, you know, because I like to write sad shit, yeah, especially back then. I think, th- yeah, those those factors you just mentioned are what I'm just into it. Probably, if not as much as, like, yeah, uh, some of the songs were very sad. But, again, going back to the point, Araby is, like, I think she got frustrated. That I, you know, I think she kind of liked that scene and that sound and wanted to be associated with it, like, maybe even more so. And then I kept changing the direction. If R.I.P. had had become a full length, I mean, I was obsessed with like early 70s British glam rock shit at that point. Like it would have, I don't think it would have borne any resemblance to Junk in that, except for the fact that this is music being made with electric guitars and drums. I'll be totally honest, if you want the real dirt, I wasn't a joy to score with. <laughs> I, I wasn't. Uh, I was very selfish in those days. Why? What would you do? What would you like? Uh, yeah, I was very selfish in those days. I was getting drunk all the time. And after one of the, I think the first time we met the Promise Ring, we did uh, a gig and then we left and we hit a deer that totaled her Bronco because we were using her Bronco with a trailer and our friends, Chris and Dave had come along and on the way home, we hit a deer and it totaled the Bronco and I was passed out in the back. I didn't even fucking 
like I don't think I even woke up or anything, <laughs> you know, like because yeah, we were hanging out with the promise ring and Carrie from Christy Fred Drive and I was having the best time ever and and then yeah, so putting up with me like being fucking shit faced half the time maybe. Um and then we were all very kind of competitive with what we thought was good music and we decided over that too. So so you were competitive in, internally in the band with writing songs? Well, I mean, yeah. There, there was never a conversation like, hey, so you're going to be the main singer and I'll just do stuff here and there. And, you know, like, no. like I, He probably would have sung on every song and so would have I. So it was, it was compromised. And then at one point, you see, like, I would write all the the music primarily, just guitar riffs, you know what I mean? And then, it's a kind of situation where I'd write guitarist, but it would be, we'd get in a room and then everyone would put their two cents in. And by the time we came out, there'd be a song. So I call that a band creating music. You know, that's, that's, that's not one guy writing song. That's a band, you know, where people have their say and they make changes. And it's a good thing because most of the time it turns out better that way. And most, most of the time. Yeah. See, I, there was one time where, I made her cry like again because she had written some songs about her friends who died and I didn't feel that they were fitting like over the song right and so I wouldn't allow it to be recorded that way and yeah there's that kind of shit you know <laughs> it seems pretty normal for some bands where it's like someone is trying to like steer the ship and then but kind of gets a bit too into like, okay, you know, this is my, this is my fucking baby. You're going to do what I said. And if, if like, we're talking about why maybe Araby is the one that has distanced herself, it's probably because Chris and I maybe had a little bit more cohesive uh, an idea of what we thought we wanted it to be. And we would agree more. So it would be like us versus her sometimes. Did you feel that like the sound you created matched the vision that you guys had, that you and Chris had? Sometimes. Sometimes I think Jay June is like most of the bands I like where there's a couple of good songs in there somewhere. Not everything's a fucking complete banger, but there's, it's got its moment. What would you have changed in some songs to make them stand out a bit more for you? We would have, I would have taken more time recording the vocals and made sure that everything was good. And then probably, had somebody that I trusted telling me what was good and what wasn't because in my mind like everything I did was great so that was dumb because some of my vocals are terrible <laughs> yeah yeah well when you guys like what was the process like when you guys recorded junk well just like it was every time you have this much fucking time to do it and if it's, it ain't finished it ain't happening so finish it how much time do you guys have to do that album like a week um that record is from like three different recording sessions uh that were like usually mostly two days oh jeez. you know two days to get a couple songs i mean if, if we yeah if you lumped it all together it might have been six days yeah sounds about right but it started the the recording process started and i think we actually used shit from it just because Araby had a project where she required she was required to record three instruments i don't know if it had to be bass guitar and drums but you know that's what she decided to do and then our recordings became that she used for a school project became like oh this sounds kind of good you know like we could use this and then me and chris probably thinking that more so than her so yeah t- again one of the final reasons is why Erby wouldn't want to do it is she she just says that like yeah she's not she she's a music engineer she worked at uh, one of the like jingle houses here for a long ass time making a bunch of money they had big time clients like Nike and Sprite and shit and she's not proud of those recordings so she's like if I was ever going to do the band again I would want to remix and remaster the records well we can't even do that because the tapes are long gone like who knows where the fuck they are and an isolation software isn't quite where it needs to be i bet it will be in like another five years maybe you know where like 
I mean, DJs are all about that shit, right? So, like, if I can have software that isolates every instrument on a track perfectly with no, you know, fucked up digital bullshit happening, then but it's just not there yet. What Kanye came out with that his own stereo that, like, can isolate a vocal track or something like that. So, I mean, I know the shit's on its way, but from everything I've looked into, it's just not quite there yet. So there's a chance that, yeah, maybe those Disney records will be released because, you know, as of now, as of now, everything on the big wheel recreation roster is not, does not exist in a streaming world. Yeah. You guys only have, you guys have two. Well, it says you have three songs on Spotify and that's a, yeah, because they were, because they were on comps. Because they were on comps and Rama doesn't own them. For some reason, Rama has no interest in making the entire Big Wheel Recreation catalog available to humankind. You know, I can sit here and talk about what a huge bummer that is for me and my band, but the, the real truth is, is that that label was an integral part of the Boston Straight Edge hardcore scene for a nice big chunk there. And none of that shit is available for streaming. Like, so like, if you want to listen to any of those fucking bands, you have to listen to like a shitty YouTube, you know, recording of it. And it's not nice and convenient there with the rest of your music. You know? Yeah. Uh, like I said, it's not even about me. It's about like, there was a lot of fucking great bands on that roster. There was a lot of really great music. And the straight edge hardcore scene in Boston is missing out if you are not able to like access that library of shit. Because you had 10 yard fight, fucking. In my eyes. Yeah, I, I think this could go on and on. You, you, I'm sure you, you could have an entire fucking podcast about just the straight edge hardcore bands that were on. Big little recreation. Yeah, I mean, I guess it just, I mean, it just costs like a good amount of money to host all that shit. But I think, like, I talked to Amy from Fiddler and I was asking her why she wouldn't put some stuff up. And she's like, it's just, she's like, it's just a pain in the dick to, like, have to send out royalties every year to, like, which band member for fractures of a penny or some shit like that. I'm like, I can kind of see that. Okay, like, okay, you might have to, like, figure that out once. But I'm pretty sure that, like, the streaming service, takes care of it after that. So when you guys put out junk, do you call it junk because it was recorded in so many different places? I, I think that's exactly what Araby called. Araby wanted to call it that because that's, I think, what she thought it was. Yeah, you know. Oh, man. It wasn't like a mass. We're, none, we weren't. He was definitely not delusional, you know, at that point of having dreams of rock stardom or any shit like that. Um, this was a way to for her to see what it was like to be in a rock band, punk band. I, I don't know. You know, yeah, it was, we had fun, but she comes from a different place. I don't think she's ever really had to worry about money too much. Might have been just a little bit of a, like a lark for her. What do you mean? Kind of a, a fit of fancy, you know, to see what it's like getting a van and going to, I don't know. She made a, she made a lot of friends. She made a lot of friends. We had fun. We made friends. Like, and Chris and I probably had our little inklings of like, wow, what if something did happen? That would be exciting, but not her as much. Did that cause like in the background when you guys were touring or just as a band that was that present basically with you? Kind of thinking like going on tour with her and knowing that she wasn't really into it. Um, I wouldn't say that I knew that. Like, I know it now, but I don't think I knew it then. I think, it, first of all, it, it's it's never cool to be like, hey, let's let's be stars. Like, let's do this and let's try to be rock stars. That is the lamest thing you can fucking do in the punk rock world, right? That That alone gives you an underlying... Thing of like, well, we're just doing this to have fun and to see what happens. And then it happened and, and uh, 
we had a little moment there and it was great but a, a lot of bands that are very successful and shit it's because they have like number one they're telling themselves we're gonna do this we're gonna be huge and then they have like a whole fucking team of people that are like facilitating the vision coming through so we weren't about any of that you know yeah Ra- i think rama i think rama did believe in us I think he believed in us actually more than any of the other bands on his roster. Like, and he, he made us felt that way, feel that way for sure. I think he saw something, you know, and he was the one putting deals together and we appreciated it and he was good at it. But uh, we just, we're dumb kids. Whose idea was it to give the, do the split with you and Jimmy at World? Probably mine and Jim. Yeah. So, I don't know how it happened, but like, so Jimmy World came and played at K, and this is like after I came home and Chris and I had been listening to their record in Boston for a year and a half. Um, I came home and they came and played at the Che, and I wore this J. June shirt that I made, and Jim came up to me and he's like, oh, oh you're in that band? I'm like, yeah, dude, yeah. He's like, oh, yeah. Harry from the Front Drive, from Christy Front Drive, played me a record and we dig it. Like, really? Uh, yeah, how the fuck did that happen? You know what I mean? Yeah. I had gone, to, I'd seen Christy Front Drive when they came through and played at uh, like the Soul Kitchen and Mesopotamia and other places in San Diego. I had no idea how a, the ba- a band, I, we started out there and got passed around enough to make it to that sector or whatever. Yeah, crazy how it happens. I, Luckily, we were around at a time where maybe um, it, the internet was not involved. Uh, I'll definitely reassure you of that. The internet was probably barely being used by tech-savvy computer dudes. Y- you could burn a CD. You could... Um, fuck, man. People were probably still using tapes, even. Yeah. I don't... Yeah. It, I, I, that's a, actually a good question, how it would have circulated initially i don't know so you became friends with them and then did you in that moment kind of like take your shot and say they always came over after the show and stayed in this house where i am right now oh wow uh and my mom yeah my mom took them dinner i mean sorry breakfast next morning and then i took them to one of my favorite spots to go cliff diving i guess it's really just going to the beach but there's some some cliffs over off sunset cliff there's one called the arch where if you go at the right time and the tide is high, you can do, you can do there's this kind of cool little place to jump. And then there's some caves around it and shit. Uh, you're not supposed to. It's, it's, I think it's always been illegal, but it's kind of a little secret San Diego spot. Don't, don't go do that unless it's high tide because people have gotten seriously hurt. But anyway, we had a super fun time. Yeah, uh, we did that. What else did we do? Did some other San Diego junk, and yeah, we just were like friends from that point. Jim was writing me postcards. That's crazy. Did you guys like when you when it, the release came out? Because that came out the same year. At, I mean, Discog says it came out the same year as Junk. So was this before Junk or was this after? Do you remember? The state. What came out the same year? It says that the split with you guys and Jimmy at World came out on Big Wheel '97. And then also it says 97 is when junk came out. So I'm wondering which came first. I don't think that's right. Um, well, okay. Yeah. So you know what? It, it, it could be, it could be that junk came out in the very beginning of 97 and that split came out at the very end. When that came out, did that give you guys, did you notice getting some more attention because of that split? Um, well, yeah, but they weren't huge yet. Yeah, that's true. But they were like known though. I mean, like you said, when I mean Static Prevails, when people had Static Prevails, they were like they, they were in love with Jimmy World. Well, considering Static Prevails is their first record, the fact that it's on Capitol technically being it's their a second. Lot, okay, it's well, right. Okay, okay. It's their second. It's their second record. I forgot. I mean, have you heard the story? Have you heard the how about how they got on Capitol Records? Yeah, like it wasn't Chrissy French Drive or something like that introduced so, them. Oh yeah, dude, like basically the story I hear from any of the guys I talk, have talked to in Christy Front Drive about it is that like somebody from Capitol called them. They thought it was a joke or something. And they, 
you know, at one point, even if they didn't think it was a joke, seriously said, hey, if you like us, you should check out Jimmy World. And like, maybe they wanted to remain independent or maybe they really did think it was a joke, but in, in, in truth, it was the best thing. Well, not necessarily, but it was why Jimmy World was disbanded on Capitol Records right off the bat. I, I got to go see them on the roof there, hang around the Capitol Records building. And that's always funny because, yeah, oh, hey, Mike E just walked by me and there's the singer of, uh, again, what was that fucking band? Uh, Everclear. Why does he look like he's going to die fucking uh, from heroin like in real life like <laughs> in two seconds? Um, yeah. And no, oh, yeah. And then one of the days that we went there with them to hang out, Sensefield was there. And so I don't, I don't know if like they were checking us and Sensefield out. We, I don't know. Somehow we both got invited to the Cowboy Records building at the same time. And I remember one guy from he pulled us into his office to some guy at Capitol. He's like, Oh yeah, I've heard you guys are good. Let me check some of this shit out. And so he put on junk. And, and so some of the guys from Stencil were in the room listening to it. What the last song comes in. I don't even remember the name of it anymore, but it's got the part where it's like, fuck you, no, fuck you. Right. Like Araby wrote fuck you as a chorus lyric um, in this song. And I just remember the guys from Stencil looking around like, wow, that's, that's bad taste. That's in poor taste. <laughs> I just, I, I just imagine, like, yeah, I got, they, they got a serious look of like, what the fuck is, what, is this? Why is girl singing fuck you? Where, where nowadays, like, that wouldn't be nothing, you know what I mean? But um, I guess it was, you know, something at that point. And then, you know, I in my mind, I just imagine, because, you know, Sensefield lyrics are like, beautiful, and, the, and how beautiful it is, and, and embrace the beautiful. Like, yeah, I, like, cussing or like doing anything vulgar with music would be nasty to them i think john too when he was alive i think he was like pretty religious wasn't he i think so yeah so yeah you know what i'm saying they were amazing live see him in like 94 and showed it you know, like, i think i did one show with my dad i was in high school i got to open for them wait you got and to yeah, open they were, they were, they were, you got to open for Sensefield when you were in a high school band yeah i was in this band called um I wish I in high school. Fuck, man. We opened for Corn. We opened for uh, Great GDH. We opened for. Um, we, we got in good with, with some of the all ages clubs around here. And we did pretty, pretty great shows. Opened for Blink. No, I think Blink opened for us. Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. It's this thing called I wish I. So, <laughs> well, here's the crazier part, and it has nothing to do with us. Our records were put out by Dim Mock Records. I don't know if you know who that is, but... That sounds familiar. Jim did a podcast with him recently, and I noticed they didn't talk about our affiliation at all, either one of them. But... <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. JK, JK. <laughs> so Steve Aoki is, like, one of the biggest... Oh, that's right, because he, he was, like, big in the hardcore scene. He was big, like, he was in a hardcore band back in the day, right? Well, he wasn't in a hardcore band, but he like was affiliated with a heart attack Dean, and then he started Dim Mac Records. Yes. And my awesome. band is really actually the first Dim Mac record released. And so it's an I Wish I record. And then, yeah, he went on to work with even like Block Party and like other really cool bands that were doing punk. And But then the label completely shifted to an EDM thing. If you look at the Dim Mock complete catalog, yes, it starts with punk and hardcore, even hardcore bands. Stick Figure Carousel might have been number one. We just feel like what the real first release was. Oh, wow. Yeah, they did Fire in the City of Automatons. They did the No Knife release, uh, Fire in the City of Automatons, Planes Mistaken for Stars. Yeah, No Knife's most popular record, I would think, you know? Yeah, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Holy shit. Well, you guys are mentioned, um, I Wish I is mentioned on their um, Wikipedia page. Right. Because he, I mean, because the, when it comes down to the true fucking facts, yes, we were in the very beginning of Steve Aoki's musical endeavors. And we were bros and he was, yeah, he was, he would have hardcore shows at his 
his uh, apartment building on the Santa Barbara uh, compound uh, called the Pickled Patch, and he would put on other shows and promotion and works for Hardtack. Yes, he was a hardcore, even straight edge hardcore. And you guys are also on their uh, Discogs for F Degrees or something album? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. I don't think you can stream, though. Or No. That might only be physical. Like, I don't even think you can physically purchase that record anymore. Yeah, it's on the list, but it doesn't really exist. Wait, so when you guys, so I just because I want to stand this for a second, when you when you went back to San Diego with Jejun, and did you have any like I wish I fans coming out to see you guys? Dude, at one point I wish I and Jejun were playing together at the same time, and that's actually what it came to a head when I had to cancel an I wish I show because of the Jejun show. So that yeah, the I wish I guys weren't necessarily happy when I came back here with another band. Because we yeah we were doing some cool we were doing some really cool shit, but eventually everybody came good friends good good friends fucking um I mean the I wish I guys lived with we all moved in with them like there was this house in Bankers Hill it's a real iconic San Diego house it's like we we all moved into this big ass house when the June eventually the other two guys relocated and I found there's this house in Bankers Hill. It's kind of an iconic house, really. Um, it's across the street from Balboa Park on 6th. Like, once you pull into, into Hillcrest, it's a big-ass white house, two-story house. And it was, like, perfect because one of the guys from Iowa Shy and a bunch of other friends lived upstairs, two of them, actually. And then the downstairs became available. And it was this amazingly massive house, yeah, in Hillcrest. You could kind of, it was a perfect situation where you could kind of only rent it to like students or like, you know, younger people because it's like, it was doctor's offices. And so there's just one bathroom at the end of the hall and five gorgeous rooms. Um, yeah, that was really beautiful, beautiful time in that house, Thorn Street house. Thorn Street. I bring it up because we all moved in there. And then Chris ended up marrying the girl that lived upstairs. And she was like, you know, living up there with the Iowa Shy guys. So, so yeah, it all, we all became one big happy family, I'd say. I'd say actually some of those guys are Chris's best friends, you know? So for Dead June, there was, there was a really cool all ages scene in San Diego. I mean, I'm ridiculously proud of the San Diego music scene. I think it is far superior to maybe everywhere except for or five other cities that can compete with it. Not even like it's, or it's better. <laughs> That's why it sucked when in Boston, uh, there was a, a punk planet interview plant. I was like, who hung out? I, I, I was hung over and I forgot about it or something. And they went and then the interview, the interviewer kind of started talking just like shit about San Diego. And I wasn't there to defend it and uh, talking about bands that, you know, are all about style and no substance. No, like they got it wrong. Like, and Chris and Araby kind of chimed in with this interviewer guy. And then <laughs> it didn't look so great, especially because they were moving here. And then JP from The Locust read it and he saw that a band that, he, he, you know, the locusts would play with a lot. I'll fuck. I'll just say it. This band, Spanacorzo. In the in the in the interview, the interviewer randomly says, "Oh yeah, I think my friend was at a show in San Diego, and one of the guys from Spanacorzo said, like, nice pants or something, because he was wearing cargo shorts or some shit." <laughs> JP read that, and then on the he made, I think the locust was playing with Spanacorzo, and he printed that particular part of the article. On the back of the flyer. <laughs> so yeah, Chris and Araby's Welcome to San Diego was like JP being like, fuck you guys. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> That's fucking great. Actually, I just talked to this guy, Mark Allen. He's in this band called Counterfeit. They were from San Diego. Yeah. Well, Counterfeit was a band with that chick, Allison, from The Kills. No, not hmm. this band. When 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 is this counterfeit from? These guys were. Let's see. When, I forgot when they got. They were like the late '90s, like era. Like they. So that's that's later then. Yeah, like they would play at um Soma and 
the the one club that's kind of by Cherry Bomb. Uh, shit, I, he just said the fucking name. Oh, the Tin Can Warehouse. No. Tin Can Ale House. I mean. No, 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 it's it's another venue. It's it's a really cool venue. It's right down the street on like seventh or something or or L. What the fuck? Oh, is that? oh, is that the uh, what is it? it? Has like a German something project, helmet project or something shit. I don't know, man. There's a, there's a couple over there. Yeah, what he was talking about. He said the all ages crowd was good. So when I lived in San Diego, I was hanging out with like the twenty one and over crowd. And these guys could give a fuck about anyone. So my taste of the San Diego scene was that 21 and over crowd. We used to go to um, Scolari's all the time and do punk rock karaoke. Oh, yeah. yeah. I met one of my girlfriends at that. Wait, you used to go to the punk rock karaoke? Of course, dude, yeah. Get the fuck out of here. Did you ever see a girl, um, this cute brunette chick, do a version of Schools Out by Alice Cooper? Probably. Yeah, J- Jason, that you- that used to put it on, Jason. Yeah, he's a bro. Oh wow, okay. I, yeah, I knew like this girl Rochelle and this girl Lainey and my friend Beth. She was going there, and like Jay from Spaz Boy. He was always there. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, and then me and him used to do a rendition of New Kids on the Block, Hanging Tough, nice. <laughs> like every Wednesday. Yeah. Anyway, but like, I mean, my but so when I was talking to him, I was I thought I had didn't get a chance to see the real San Diego scene. So it's funny that you're saying that the all ages scene was great too, because I just didn't witness it. So it's cool to give them like a shout out in this podcast because people are probably like, Hey man, like we seem to be a little bit forgotten here. Yeah. The places that were really cool, I guess when I was in high school and just to, with anybody else that remembers are yeah. Soma, Soma was great when it was downtown. Soma was fucking the best. And yes, everyone ha- hates the, its owners and blah, blah, blah. Um, it's been that, that forever. They pissed off Pagazi and John Reese and everybody cool ever. But when you're 14 years old and your mom drops you off in a shitty part of downtown, you walk into this big, gnarly two-story building and you see punk rock bands every fucking weekend, new local bands that you didn't know about and eating people. It's the greatest thing in the world. Like someone was someone was this shit. When it moved it, the first time it lost magic. When it moved again it lost more magic. I think it's still open now. But yeah, Soma was as far as a venue fucking the coolest thing you could ask for as a young person. Uh but then yeah there was also like some going down in East County like Mesopotamia, the Soul Kitchen and then over by City College in downtown, um, Chape, Chape, Chava Lava. Man, a good handful of other places. So just speaking of venues, and this, I've talked to a couple bands that have been on the Actuality of Thought disc um, video comp, and you guys were on that. Do you remember anything about that show, like that house, or any? is there any cool story around that? Oh, yeah, I remember, I remember the, the whole thing. Didn't think much of it at the time. It was a show in kind of what seemed like an Elf Lodge kind of a joint. Yeah, some tables were moved aside. You know, there was maybe 20 people there or something. It was, it wasn't like it was open for Jimmy Eat World or Mineral or shit. Yeah, it was just kind of one of those shows you, like, I don't want to say filler, but like you're, lu- <laughs> you're lucky or you feel lucky that the thing actually happened because it, you know, it, it isn't like a massive enterprise yeah it looked like a small venue in the video Mm -hmm. did you know the guy was going to be in or was going to be videotaping that or did you find that after the comp came out yeah i think somebody said something about there's cameras but we didn't think much of it obviously because when it came out rama got all pissed and like i mean kind of rightfully so i mean you're not really supposed to just tape a band back then it was different now that everything's free back then there was a sense of ownership and so when rama found out and he saw this and so he calls the guy and threatens him and fucking like i think we eventually settled on like a box of this tape yeah that shit was like iconic for me because we i had and like i was in a band we we ended up playing in greenville north carolina and we're at the skate park and that was where they filmed like a bunch of that so, I mean, the, the the whole video was shot basically in like the triangle or like North Carolina, South Carolina. Do you remember where the venue was that you guys played? Oh man. Yeah. It, 
it was definitely one of those three places you just mentioned. Yeah, um, south, southern part of the Midwest. And yeah, I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly where, though. Yeah, I figured it's like, it's just kind of a stretch because it was so long ago and it doesn't seem like it was a, a huge club or anything like that. But Well, if anything, I'm at school that you, you dug that, that thing. It's, number one, I'll, there's two reasons why that video is cool. Number one, because it's basically just silhouette of a band playing with a cute girl in a ponytail. Number two, because that song was like different even like for us. We're like, let's do a song that's pretty much instrumental, but has like a smit bit of both at the end. Oh, sorry about the wind chimes. Hold on, I'm going to go back inside. Coffee and cigarettes wake me up. <laughs> so that video is taken. How, how close were you guys from that point to breaking up? Like, what's the timeline there? It was like a good three years, I think. I feel like that was that video was like in the second year of us touring or something like that. How often did you guys tour? Were you out on the road a lot? Yeah, that was the that was the mentality. That's how <clears throat> fans got popular. At least seven, eight months for probably a couple good years there. Holy shit! Three, four years there. Yeah. That must have been a bitch because you guys had to start in San Diego every time and then drive like massive drives just to start getting towards the East Coast, which was a lot, which was less intense. Yeah, we all, we often thought it would be nice to if you lived at like at least somewhere kind of in the middle of like New York or Chicago or something and to get around to some of those bigger metropolitan cities and yeah, LA was not like super huge place for us to hone our ambition. We played some cool shows, we played the whiskey, KXLU was a pretty dominating cool force back then. That's the radio station that was um, associated with. Loyola Marymount, but they had some pacemakers working there. They played some cool stuff, and they'd have live sessions. So I think they had some CDs, actually, uh, or some recordings. <laughs> I should say the most KSLU in-shop performances. Like, there was a story about how Carp played, and they drove their van, like, right down the middle of the plaza and over a fountain to get to the <laughs> Or the radio station was, or whatever. And, um, yeah, everybody did that. LA, and then yeah, what uh, we always, oh, yeah, LA wasn't a massive thing. Concentrate on it. It was more about getting out. What were you guys like on the road? Were you? Because you said before that you were like there was some story where you got drunk or something. Were you guys partiers or? Um, I was. Yeah, for sure. Um, not so much. Therapy. She is classy girl <laughs> i was i was like experiencing freedom uh to the ultimate extent as possible and not thinking about consequences for a long time there did it cause problems not really like i probably maybe made bad impressions on people sometimes that probably could have helped but we got so much love from people that i respected that i didn't think too much about it chris wasn't like into getting drunk and so i don't want to get too personal into chris's shit but there was reasons why he didn't like to see people get drunk and so uh we would kind of have almost like a difference of opinions yeah there'd be there'd be like a little bit of resentment between me and chris even if i just you know cracked open a beer because he didn't want he didn't want me to fuck shit up i mean that i get it he was like yeah <laughs> He was smart. When you guys went to record this afternoon's Malady, so you said? Yeah. When you guys did that, like, what was that experience like? Um, again, the same thing where, like, you've got time. It's a little bit more this time, but it's got time to go and get everything down. And if it ain't done when, when it's done, then it ain't done. So probably could have prepared for it better. I was just trying to write the perfect song that point and when you're trying to do that like nothing's gonna be good enough ever so it was awesome because it was with ted leo who produced it oh wow from chisel yeah i mean we had all had a big admiration for him you know we're in a freezing studio in massachusetts for like two weeks there's no good food around one night they all ate they got chinese food and like Arabi. i think they were all vegetarian except for me I think they all vomited uh, the food up because they were convinced that it had been cooked in 
animal fat. Um, <laughs> it was, it was, it was fun, but yeah, I, w- I just wish that I'd had maybe someone kind of telling me, Hey, that, that's not so great. It's not as great as you think it is. You know what I mean? Like that, that vocal part, you might think it's okay, but you can do it better. You know? Yeah. It's, I, I, w- I kind of wish I'd had a little bit more of that. But wasn't that the point of like having Ted Leo though? Um, yeah, but Ted is a cool guy. So if he sees that you're maniacal about your vision, he's not going to fucking try to change it. He's just going to try to make it sound as good as possibly can. Production. He wasn't a producer necessarily so much on the creative front of it. I don't think he wanted to be. Did you like get it? Did you pick up any pointers from him from being in the studio? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, he, he had some cool production ideas. I think it's funny that like on one song, I was like, I'm going to do the Kevin Shields and use the wa- the whammy to make a, you know, all out of tune, weird uh, rhythm track. But then he like insisted that he do it. And I was just like, okay, I'm going to do it. You can do it. So I think there was kind of a little bit of both of us maybe experimenting on that record. So which one did you like better, that or junk? Uh, nowadays, I like junk better. When the second record came out, did you find that like, I don't know, did... But I'll just tell you straight up, I don't think any of us were all that super stoked on it. The second So record? that's kind of a bummer, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a bummer when, like, you know your drummer isn't really happy with the way that, the, you know, the record turned out and... <sighs> yeah. What? That's how it happened. So, what leads to like the demise of the band in a couple of years? Like, what was the final straw? Araby wanted to play in a band with her boyfriend. It, it, well, I mean, obviously, she was unhappy with the creative end of it. Like, if she had been happy with the creative end of it, then maybe it would have you know, kept her involved. But again, I was I was morphing. I was obsessed again with like early seventies British glam rock type shit at that point. And I didn't feel like I had to, I, I felt like very, I, I guess, invincible back then. Oh, I can sh- completely change the sound of the fucking band if I want to. Like when, yeah, there were people telling me like, that's not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. Was Rama telling you that? Oh, definitely. Yeah. His girlfriend, even more than him. Like, yeah. I think it directly came out of her mouth at one point when she heard um, this afternoon's melody for the first time was like, well, your first record was more like eating candy. And this one is more like a Guns N' Roses or some shit. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Did you think like, did you want to keep the band? I mean, it sounds like you wanted to keep the band going when Araby quit. Well, yeah, man, we were supposed to go to Japan we had some interest from some interesting people. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I did. You had said before that you grew up in, like you went to a Catholic school and you had strict parents. Did you think like wanting to be on tour all the time was your way? Like, were you doing that because you believed in the band and wanted to go somewhere or were you doing it more so for the fact of you just had, you wanted that complete freedom that you didn't have when you were growing up? Um, I think that I wanted to make music that I thought was incredible, you know, really thought I could or whatever. And there seemed to be enough people that were willing to help me on that mission. So I think I was just happy about that. It it was just all about, as cliche as that sounds, if it was just all about the music for me, I, I wanted to... I'm, I'm still the, I'm still that same person. I'm still trying to make this song that somehow like defines me or something. Did you guys feel like when you were writing the songs and the albums, because since you guys came from Berkeley and had this, besides Araby just picking up the bass and all that, did you guys feel that you like brought to the table that that musical that musicianship that you had from going to Berkeley? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I knew that it was a factor. You can listen to Araby's singing, and it's not like she's trying to sing like 
the dude from Modest Mouth. It's not like a stylistic way of singing. It's a very like traditional, I'm projecting fucking way of singing that like I'm showcasing my voice kind of thing. And like, that was one of the things that maybe Chris and I at times kind of weren't all about. It's like weirder shit. Yeah, the, the musicianship thing, um, I, don't, we, I don't think we felt like we were any different than any of the bands that we played with. In fact, it was probably a bad thing. Punk rock is not about being a virtuoso fucking musician. It's about how cool you get this thing across that you're trying to, right? You know, it's like if you want to you showcase your virtuosity, then start a fucking metal band or something. Um, like, the stuff that I was really into at that point was pumpkins. The Christie Front Drive record had a massive effect on me, obviously. I just wanted to be in a cool rock band. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't about anything else other than that. So um, our sound and the, the scene that we ended up in, like, yeah, I don't, it, none of that was strategized at all. The Promise Ring with us ending up on some shows with The Promise Ring, like, so early, it lets you know, like, what people thought of our sound. But um, did I have any intentions of, like, that? No. Do you feel like because you got lumped in with that whole scene that your songs kind of had to match it? No, that's, and, and I don't think they do. Yeah, no, that, that's, 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 that's pretty much the whole thing I'm trying to tell you is that like that our association, our association with that scene was by no means like themed or fucking ever even discussed or anything. We just found ourselves there. And yeah, the fact that I really loved the Jimmy Eat Well, you know, record and made friends with them and that news got out quick or whatever, um, that's just because an amazing record you know it was it, it was a different sound it was it, it, there was a different sound and i liked it yeah i mean dude i've been listening to drive like jay those guys are you know our heroes and still are i i, I play with john reese now you know mission accomplished what did he do in the band oh um so trombino yeah, was the drummer right yeah yeah so drive like jay who before that um you know uh his sport uh that's that's John and yeah, Rick and John were Pitchfork and Drive Like Jehu, which, if you ask me, is still the best band from a post hardcore. I could never get into that record. I, I, I can understand where people, it's either you love it or hate it. I could never, I listened to it the other day, though. I was like, I just can't. Which one? The one with which like one? The, Prime? the one with the, 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 um, the ink dropper on the cover. Yeah, see. Listen to the first one. I mean, if you don't like that one, then you might not like Jay Who at all. But it's first one is still my favorite, and you can't even stream that anymore because Cargo Records is similar to Big Wheel in that they have not made their entire catalog available for streaming, which is a real fucking shame too. Because Cargo Records had, you know, premier San Diego shit. Yeah, the Cargo put out um the first Blink album, right? With that with the grilled cheese with grilled cheese. Is that the same record label? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. So I'm gonna start wrapping this up. Um, before I ask the last two questions, is there like a story from back then that you've never told in an interview that you want to tell now? It could be like some crazy story, it could be a funny story. It doesn't have to be anything that's like, you know, it's whatever you want it to tell. Um, uh, there's there's a guy who like um, uh, documented the scene. And his name is Paul. He was with us when my friend, so when I was in Boston, my friend Dave, I met these, I met people, a uh, guy lived in Roxbury, his name was Dave. He ended up being like moving out with the rest of the band uh, to San Diego and then ended touring up with us and stuff. And yeah, when our band, when our band broke down, uh, it was in the middle of this, uh, of Utah, some shitty part of Utah. I think this story has been told in a zine before, but when the van broke down, uh, we ended up in a junkyard for a while, hanging out. And at the junkyard, there was this fat guy riding a tricycle and a cowboy hat around. And he like, we didn't see him. And all of a sudden he just kind of crept up on us and we all got really freaked out. That's a dumb story. I, yeah, I don't know. No, <laughs> but I don't really I don't have anything for you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, where is this going? 
Yeah, I, 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 I would tell you about, you know, the chance encounter of meeting some celebrity or something like that, but that's stupid. And the fact is that I just don't remember very much. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good three years of touring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, okay. I know. I'll tell you this one. Okay, so we were in Europe. I think we were in Germany or some small town in Germany or something. And I was, you know these German guys noticed that I was drinking it's two weird, real weird, creepy looking guys. They decided to make me like their buddy for the night. And they like pulled me into their booth and they kept getting me fucked up and fucked up oh, at the end of the night. I'm shit faced and I'm on the standing on the street with them. Everybody in the entourage has noticed like these guys are like clinging on to Joey at this point, it's very strangely. And like they'd come up a couple of times and I'm like, hey, Joey, man, we're going. And those the guys are like, no, no, he's coming with us. He's coming with us. But uh, no, it's just, you know, like, like we have more beers or some shit. I'm like, yeah, I'm going with them or whatever. And so I think they had to pull up the van, like it, to, up to the street where we're hanging out with these guys and grab me by the shirt and try to yank me in the van as these two guys were like not letting me go. Yeah, that, that made for a funny story <laughs> for oh, everybody Jesus. else. Yeah, you just got to wonder what would have happened like, if the band had not come to the rescue for me. See, when you said that, but, uh, I, I thought they were driving the van initially, and I was like, oh, my God, but it turns out it was just your band trying to save you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the corner. With, I'm standing on the street with these guys that aren't going to let me go. Yeah, Rob, the driver, pulled up the van. I think Todd, Chris grabbed me, like, and they're pulling me down the street, you know, with the van door open while these guys are still running after me. So, like, yeah, I don't know. Must have had something they wanted real bad if it wasn't just the value of my life. But, <laughs> they just really enjoyed your conversation. Yeah. yeah, I think that's what it was, really. <laughs> yeah. It is a charmer. I'm a real charmer. All right, man. Uh, last question. I'll let you go. Uh, what? Actually, no. Two more questions before I let you go. Um, before the last one, what would you like to plug? It could be about you. It could be about a friend. It could be about both. Um, well, I'd like to plug, yeah, the new Swami record. I finally got to, well, finally, I, don't, I got to play on a record with my favorite San Diego artist of all time. And now we're doing a little touring and playing around. We got a New Year's show coming up. Please check out the Swami record. Um, I was hanging out. I met Andrew from Drab Majesty two nights ago because uh, I did a show with Gary Wilson at Footsies in L.A. He's just super cool. Drab Majesty, I, I'm hoping that maybe he asked me if I want to maybe come fuck around on a keyboard with him at some point. I played with Lee Rocker from the Stray Cats for a while because rock and roll piano is really what I do best, I guess. I play in a band called Cashed Out. It's a Johnny Cash tribute act, which usually I don't really like tribute acts all that much, but I love Johnny Cash um, and this guy's voice. Uh, Doug sounds amazingly, amazingly like the man in black. Yeah, so I'm going to plug my own shit, obviously. Nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my solo record. Uh, yeah, there's not even a way to search for any of the stuff, but yeah. The new Swami record. Check it out. Okay. Uh, all right. Last question. What scene ethics do you hold on to to this day? Um. Wow. None. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not. I, I was never straight edge. Um. And uh, the whole DIY thing. Um. I was never a record label owner or. Um a promoter or anything like that. Now I just play at venues and bars like any other asshole. Um, yeah. If I was involved somehow with all ages stuff and, or had a political punk agenda, you know, I'd have a better answer for you, but nah, 